Hello. On July 9, President Biden issued an executive order to promote competition in the American economy. The order claims that industries have consolidated, competition has weakened in too many markets. ATF has released an analysis that demonstrated that consolidation has not increased and competition is still vibrant in most markets. Nevertheless, the Biden administration appears committed with this executive order to adopt a whole of government approach whereby all relevant federal agencies and federal department heads gather in a newly created White House Competition Council to implement 72 initiatives included in the executive order. What are the problems the executive order tries to fix? Are the proposed initiatives adequate to promote competition without chilling innovation with uh, regulatory interventions? I am Orion Portuez, the director of the Schumpeter Project on Competition Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Today, to, to decipher President Biden's ex executive order on competition, I'm joined with two well-known experts, an economist, Carl Shapiro, who is professor of economics at the Business School uh, and Department of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and a lawyer, Barack Orbach, who is professor of law at the College of Law at the University of Arizona. Both have written extens extensively on antitrust issues. Carol, Barak, uh, thank you for joining us. I guess I want to kick off the discussion uh, with the assumptions be behind this executive order. Corporate consolidation has increased and competition has decreased. Carl, what do you think about the state of the, eco the, of the American economy in terms of consolidation and the level of competition? Does consolidation always lead to less competition? And have we witnessed less competition in the American economy um, recently? Well, thank you, Ryan. Pleasure to be here. Let me start with what is either a disclosure, a confession, or a brag. Um, I, last fall, I was a part of a group. We published a, a report on recommendations for the Biden administration about antitrust. It was done through the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Tim Wu was one of the co-authors with me, and now he is in the White House in the uh, National Economic Council um, and uh, an important uh, person developing this very executive order. So I have um, uh, some of these things in terms of the whole of government approach to improving competition, I have endorsed. So uh, like I said, confession or brag, you, you decide. Um, so a lot, there's a lot I like about the executive order. We'll be talking about that, but the preamble, is very interesting. It's section one, it's called policy. And what this is, is a statement, whereas, whereas the American economy is suffering from monopolies, whereas all these terrible things have happened, we need to act. The trouble with this political statement is it's not an accurate reflection of the evidence. Um, I'm sorry to say. Um, it greatly overstates the extent of uh, monopoly. It greatly overstates the extent to which there has been a decline in competition in the American economy. Um, and of course, we can understand why the White House might do that. If you say there's a terrible problem, then you need dramatic solutions. If the problem is not so great, you know, then solutions are different. Uh, so why do I say it's inaccurate? Um, there's a lot of literature about this, and I've written several articles myself over the past several years trying to give a what I would call a fair and accurate description of what has happened in the economy. And I do think in some sectors we have problems with competition, many healthcare sectors, for good, parts of the healthcare sector, for example. Airlines doesn't look so good. We could, go, we could name some others. But to say it's widespread and that antitrust has been asleep at the switch, I just think is not accurate. So, so there's, um, there's a problem there. There's a view that employers, there's a suggestion at least, if employers widely have a power and have great power and are depressing wages as a result, it might be true, I'm sure it is true in some areas, but the evidence is not as strong as the preamble suggests. And then as another example, they talk about in the preamble decline of local newspapers as a result of the tech platforms. Well, there has been a decline of no local newspapers. It's of considerable concern in terms of investigative journalism and democracy, but it's not because of dominance, it's because advertising has shifted to online platforms. It's, it's a competition in the advertising market that's caused this. 
particularly first and foremost, actually first with uh, with Craigslist and the classified ads that that abandoned newspapers some time ago. So so there's there's a real problem here with the diagnosis. And when you have an improper diagnosis, you can end up with uh, the wrong treatment being recommended. Right. Um, that's that's very true. It's one view of uh, competition where uh, it looks like the uh, the the objective is to have perhaps more competition in the sense of smaller companies and and less uh, dominance. This perhaps this uh, uh, view of more atomized view of the market structure. Uh, Barak, do you want to have a say on that? There's there's a tradition. In it. So, hey, first of, um, thank you for having me. It's almost to be here and the. Uh, Talking about after call is always difficult. So let me just try to add a few tiny points. A, I don't think that there's one vision of competition. I, I just find it messy. Uh, it's kind of a lot of points that look bad and or some people consider them bad and they lack precision. But I'm fine with lack of precision as far as policies goes. It's never precise, it's policy, but there, there should be some kind of line. There are two points that I think it will deserve attention. One thing is that we have obsession about increased productivity and increased employment. So when we are talking both about increasing productivity and more employment, we should recognize that when technology changes, when we have increased productivity, it comes with elimination of jobs and there is some transition period. So one aspect of that seems to be lacking in a meaningful way. If we really want to address technological change, we, we should focus about how we address this transition from one technological age to another. And I think that that's kind of lacking or it's, it's, not, it's not within competition law, but that's where one of the key challenges that we're facing. Another aspect in terms of more competition, not less competition, the, the, one of the key tenets of the digital economy is that it's a low friction trade. And that has allowed actually expansion of markets and a radical increase in competition among small businesses, uh, such as those on Etsy, etc. We can find a person who could do everything for us or for a price. We have many intermediaries that help us to find. So in many ways, actually, competition is stronger than it has ever been for small businesses. This is not to say that there are no challenges, but we should recognize that low friction allows us to do more. At the same time, the institutions that reduce frictions have a lot of power. These are the digital platforms. But again, the diagnosis seems to be lacking. Well, right. That's Let me pick that's up what... on that with another sure. point or two before we move on. So first, what you said, there's a clear, you get the very clear sense in this executive order preamble that the White House is concerned about large firms taking a larger share of the economic activity and smaller firms are facing the competition, it's very hard on them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of concern about small businesses, which of course is a longstanding political, mm -hmm. we've always had that in a sense of politics mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, but it, but it, the, I think the evidence shows that a lot of the uh, increase in the share of activity, economic activity going to large firms is because sometimes called superstar firms in the literature is because they are very efficient and mm -hmm. they're competing effectively against the smaller firms. And in some cases that does lead to uh, more concentrated markets as a result of the competitive process. That is rejected by the populace. They want to deconcentrate. That's very clearly the goal. And they talk about political reasons for that. I'm concerned that that will, lead, that will, will uh, undermine com competition and will act against competition, which is, the, which is what the stated goal of this executive order is to promote competition. So there's real tension there uh, in what in this deconcentration urge. That's interesting what you just said, Carl. And like the, the populists may perhaps overlook uh, these economies of scales, which are very inherent to the digital economy. Because the more the bigger you are, the more you can reap uh, scale economies, which in itself is reinforcing. Uh, and it's it's hard not to see efficiencies. Uh, in, in those scale economies, right? It, it, absolutely. Look, the the, uh, the, the populists who, who more like to call themselves neo-Brandeisians sometimes, well, I've looked carefully, and it's very interesting. Justice Brandeis was a fascinating figure. He, in the first 20 years of the 20th century, he did not believe that large firms were more efficient. He rejected that based on his own experience growing up in the Midwest. He was wrong about that. The evidence is very clear. This was a time when the American, where, where uh, big firms were becoming much more efficient. 
gaining scale, and it was an enormous part of productivity increase. So we know a century later that economies of scale are very important. And policies that try to stop firms from exploiting economies of scale for international trade, too, and exports are going to be very harmful for the economy. I'm concerned about that. Let me just add a quick point that uh, Brandeis' mistakes, and the, it, it should be unquestionable that he was wrong about his perception of analysis, but it can be excused. It was in the early 20th century. Even economists did not fully understood. So that's, that can be defended, his mistakes. One, uh, one century later, the notion that we go back to that type of perceptions, that's, not, that's indefensible. We know much more. We have learned a lot. So I think that this kind of approach that we're learning from Brandeis is is misguided and, un, and and unfortunate. That's kind of that that that's kind of one point about the, the so-called populists. The other point is that they expressly attack preferences for convenience and low prices. And in cheat chats over dinner, perhaps we should say, "Oh, low prices kill us." But in reality, consumers have persistently preferred con a convenience and low prices over other things. And we should recognize that this will end. This will win at the end of the day. Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, perhaps to qualify this point of uh, Brandeis' excuse, because at the time of Brandeis' writings, there was, of, of course, also Schumpeter's writings, which were quite... Uh, quite different, but uh, that's that's another, another point. Right, so Barack, precisely this uh, this executive order advocates for a whole of government approach, as Carl has, has referred. And this whole of government, of course, uh, will lead federal agencies and, and, and departments to uh, have new roles, uh, new administrative roles. Uh, but the question is, can these administrative roles achieve the stated objectives of the executive orders without new antitrust laws from, let's say, the Congress? Or can we promote competition within the current antitrust laws uh, with administrative rules? Or do we need new antitrust laws from the Congress, as we see both the House and the Senate are trying to, to, to introduce? So, so let me start with the beginning. The whole of government approach is probably the single most valuable aspect element of the executive order in my mind. And I think that all antitrust people throughout history uh, believe that uh, we don't have enough uh, alliance in terms of uh, uh, government arms, that some suppress competition and other advance. So if anything, that's the single most valuable thing. I would add to that that executive orders in one aspect of executive orders is to articulate principles for agencies. So about 20 years, about 30 years ago, we adopted cost-benefit analysis, mm -hmm. and it was controversial at the time, and there were generations of uh, law professors who explained why cost-benefit analysis is evil, but it was an ex extraordinarily valuable. So I consider this executive order as a kind of a similar statement that competition is one of the, one of the principles that guides our government, in terms of delivery, I think that it's, a little, it's not an elegant delivery, and it, for, it is a little bit fuzzy, and so it's, it's missed the point. But overall, the whole of government is a wonderful idea, not only for the United States, I think that in every country, and people will, and, and people, antitrust practitioners will be excited about it. I think in every antitrust agency, we should have more. Execution is complicated, but it's just as it was complicated with cost-benefit analysis. It takes time, it's a process, but hopefully we'll get there. Yeah. Come. Well, I would, when I was at the chief economist at the Justice Department, there's really at least two big parts of the job, and this is the antitrust division. One is enforcing the antitrust laws, investigations and cases. The other is what we call competition advocacy, which is trying to promote competition in all other ways, mm -hmm. particularly through the federal government, because there are a lot of agencies that are captured. And they don't promote competition, they stifle competition. So I am really want to applaud the White House for applying pressure, basically, to all these other agencies to promote competition. Now, whether each one is a good one or not, I mean, we could look at case by case. There's, there's many different agencies. But let me give a few examples that I think are great, okay? And I hope it, it's gonna take pressure from the White House. I'll tell you, we've tried this, okay? Um, they, Hearing aids, you know, the over-the-counter hearing aids will be cheaper and better, assuming it can be done in a way that's, you know, that's safe and healthy. So that's a, that's a, that's in there. And I think it's going to happen pretty soon, and I expect they'll take credit for it. That's good. There's a lot of other FDA rules 
that allow gaming and trouble, you know, that, 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 that stifle generics. Um, there's standard essential patents where the patent office and the Trump DOJ did terrible things to that raise the costs of, of products unnecessarily. DOD procurement. These are all in this executive order. A lot of things in the agriculture department, which is a tricky area politically, but there's there's orders there, including the Kepper Volstead Act and the Packard and Stock, Packers and Stockyard Act. Occupational licensing, they talk about trying to open up. We did that when I was in the White House in the Obama. We tried to do that so that military spouses could move from one state to another and still practice their profession. So long as, you know, reciprocity is more of a state thing, but the feds could push. The FCC spectrum auctions, again, we did that during the Obama administration to, to try to create more competition in broadband and cell, and, and, uh, cell phones, airlines. So where DOG, DOJ and DOT have long been squabbling over things, the DOT at times can be captured by the industry. So there's a huge amount to do there, and it does require ongoing pressure from the White House. And that's, that, again, I want to give them great credit for having a long list of these things, and it's going to be for the White House to keep the pressure up on these agencies who, in many cases, do not want to do this because their constituency tends to be the producers rather than the consumers. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Let, let me add one quick point. I think that there should be a consensus about the whole of government, but in terms of execution of policies, when we look at long-term effectiveness of policies, when you have a checklist of how it should be implemented, that kind of uh, watered down the effectiveness of the principles. So in terms of execution, I would have had executive orders that articulate the principles that for generation to come, people will learn the principles, not with the list uh, that includes hearing aids and other highly, impo highly important things, but I would not bundle them with the principles. It's just not elegant. And again, when we look at the history of, of public policy, it tends to uh, compromise the effectiveness of the policy. Right. It's like perhaps too practical to narrow uh, rather than having those uh, principles. And I think just come back to Carl's point of uh, occupational licensing, also government created obstacles to competition are consensually uh, recognized as barriers to competition. And that's uh, that's very one positive effect of the executive order to identify those uh, those, those those barriers to to competition to keep to stay with you uh carl on on one topic that is of course your uh your your niche topic as the the merger guidelines i mean because the executive order clearly uh clearly asks uh the antitrust agencies the ftc and the doj to revise uh the merger guidelines both horizontal and vertical uh, merger guidelines we've seen the doj and the ftc in july right after the executive order uh, jointly uh, committing uh, themselves to revise uh, those guidelines. And then we, see, we saw, of course, the FTC uh, very recently to unilaterally uh, rescind at least the, uh, the, the merger, merger guidelines. And that is uh, something that also created some concerns uh, by you uh, in an article that you wrote with Herbert Ovenkamp uh, very recently. So you've been very instrumental in drafting the two, uh, 2010 uh, uh, horizontal merger guidelines. And uh, you have this ad agency knowledge uh, about how those guidelines have been drafted and also implemented. How do you see this call for revision of the guidelines and also, of course, this, uh, this development, the recent developments on the merger guidelines? Well, I hope you're ready for a two hour lecture here because I've got so much to say. Um, so let me start by distinguishing, by telling people, we've had horizontal merger guidelines, mergers between competitors since 1968 in this country. And they've been revised a number of times, 1982, 92, and 2010 most significantly. These are a very important set of guidelines that have, I think, been enormously successful and influential in advising the business community and uh, in, in having a dialogue with the courts as merger law has developed, which has made merger law actually develop in a much more healthy way than some other parts of antitrust um, that, uh, that I won't get into. So, it, so th it's a great success story, and I was part of that. So, you know, factor that in, you know, to my views. 
In contrast, and I want to distinguish the vertical merger guidelines, which are the ones that the FTC just withdrew a month or so ago. Those, um, those are much less important, much less influential. They were basically, there was a kind of a dormant version of them from 1984 that were a dead letter. They were basically reintroduced in 2020. And it's those guidelines that were then withdrawn by the Federal Trade Commission. Let's set aside the vertical. It's got much less of a history. Um, it's, it's important, particularly since the both agencies are going to be going more after vertical mergers, buyer-seller relationship. But I'm just don't want. Let's not get. There's enough to say on horizontal. So, so we'll see what they do. Horizontal and it, so, so they're, like I said, they're, these uh, guidelines have been revised, um, and I think it's a great story. What has never happened before, so far, as far as I know, and I keep pretty close to this, is for the White House to instruct the agencies to do a revision. Right. What has happened in the past is the agencies have said, "Well, our own enforcement experience is such that we're." We want to tell the commu business community in a new, updated way how we're handling mergers because you know there are mergers are you know trillions of dollars a year, huge business, and um, it's, you know it's part of good government to tell people what you're doing, and also to to have a dialogue with the courts, like I said. So it's it's peculiar to me for the White House to be instructing this uh, from the agencies, but okay, fine, let's put it aside. The question is, what will they do with it? Okay. Um, the um, a lot of uh, I, there's a number of things that could be updated. It'll be about 12 years since they were last done in 2010. I have a list myself. I'm planning to write a paper about what they should do, um, in my view. Um, but but um, I am concerned about what the FTC in particular might do, given the writings of the chair and her, and her other things she said. Um, that uh, let's just say if the agencies put it out for guidelines that are n not consistent with the case law, it's going to cause problems because it's not law. It's just telling the courts and the public, here's what we do. Something and the courts like can say, well, that's interesting what you do, but mm -hmm. we're going to follow the case law, which is what judges do and are required to do <laughs> under mm -hmm. our system. So, um, when we revised the guidelines, when I was there, we were very careful to make it consistent with case law. But, but explain to the courts how we were updating things in a way that we thought was more accurate, but consistent with the statute and the case law. So we'll see. It's early days. I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, I think it's, it was um, it was part of what you mean is like was part of an incremental improvement, taking the case law and improving from the basis of the, of the case law, where perhaps what we see uh, would be more like a radical overall of the approach, which might create a drift between the case law and the administrative uh, practice. Exactly. So given that the rhetoric of the populace, and you see this in the preamble to the EO, is antitrust law has gone off the rails and been misguided for 40 years. And as a result, we've had terrible things in the economy. That's the, that's the narrative. Again, I think that's mm -hmm. not correct, but that's the narrative. The implication is if we're going to, we're going to completely change how we do mergers because it's been so badly handled for 40 years. And mm -hmm. that suggests, um, you know, a, a radical change or, or a very dramatic change. And first, I think that would be a mistake as policy, but I'm not in charge. If the people in charge think they want to do that, they should tell the world about it. The point of guidelines is to let the world know how you're going to evaluate mergers, the merger guidelines. But then what will the courts do if it's so different than the case law? Um, I, I certainly didn't want to go there when we were revising the guidelines in 2010. Barack? Let me add a, a, an outside perspective. So very few people have a Carl's a expertise in guidelines. I, just from the general perspective of how, of how mergers are reviewed in the U.S., the merger guidelines have been a jurisprudential anomaly and a good one. It is, a, it is a policy articulated by agencies. What Carl called a dialogue between agencies as court is extraordinarily unusual. That's not the way we, we have in other areas of law. However, because of the technical aspects of merger review, we have learned that that was worked well. It is generally inconsistent with all the ordinary jurisprudential uh, standards. But again, in this context, it has worked well. Definitely people can be critical of how it works. Definitely everything can be improved. 
For example, I think that in the 2010 guidelines, there were many standards that were too complicated for courts to implement. But again, over time, it's something that dialogue can improve. What seems to be missing in the present approach is the understanding that antitrust is common law and it is developed through courts and there is some component of courts and it's not that you, know, you can have a presidential order and that the agencies can therefore can subsequently totally revise the policies. It's a very nuanced matter of how it is evolved. And again, overall, it has been a very positive experience in the US as a template for other countries. Could it be improved? Of course. Can there be disagreements? Of course. But the approach, general approach, has been valuable and it seems that kind of the, the executive order seems to be to reflect misunderstanding of what the guidelines are about. And that's that's very well, interesting. Yeah, I can't. Well, let me pick up on that. When the when they say the DOJ goes to court to challenge a merger, if you think about it from the judge's point of view, the DOJ says, all right, we should win this case and we should do it because here's how we say the analysis should go. The courts will say, well, you're one, you're the plaintiff, but that doesn't mean I have to do it your way, right? I mean, the defendant might have another way of the case law. So the, the courts don't generally say, oh, well, the plaintiff gets to decide what the rules are, right? It's no. the case law. But because, if it's persuasive, if it's convincing, mm -hmm. it's helpful that the DOJ says, look, this is how we do things generally. We have a lot of experience. It's, we're not making it up for this case. And that has been convincing because the guidelines have generally been done well over the years. And I hope that revision will fit into that pattern. But if it's a radical change, hard to see how it fits. That's very important to say that antitrust remains. Let me quickly <laughs> amplify the point that Carl made. Yeah. In an ordinary circumstances, courts give some kind of standards that agencies have to implement. The distinctive aspect of the merger guidelines is that the agencies come to court and they persuade the courts to adopt their standards. Yeah. It's a very unusual, but again, has been effective and probably judges are grateful. They do not want to learn a uh, principle, uh, economics or a, very, a variety of things. So the unique thing is that it has been this dialogue that the agencies come to courts and say, this is why we think that things should change. And the courts actually adopt, is, is guided or instructed or learned from the agencies. Very unusual, but again, has been enormously successful and powerful. And, and just to I take, just, uh, I just wrote a paper last year with Howard Chelansky where we, where we evaluated all the court cases in the years before the 2010 guidelines and the 10 years after. And one thing that is striking is in every case, we read all the cases, the courts first accepted the guidelines as a framework, and so did the defendants. Mm -hmm. The defendants did not say, oh, these things are crazy, you shouldn't do yeah. it. The defendant said, we accept the guidelines, but if you apply them, we should win. Right. That's good. It, it good was place. a common and the, framework. And the appeals court has also said, we, we, we accept these as, as persuasive authority that it's convincing. It's not the case law, but it's so that's a great place. I just, yeah. I just, who, whatever is done to the guidelines, they should reflect the enforcement priorities of the people who are in charge, but I hope they won't lose that um, special uh treatment the guidelines have gotten because they have been carefully crafted in the past yeah it, it must and that's very important uh it must be commonly accepted both by the plaintiff and the defendant in order to be uh some standards that are reliable right uh and i think that's what's the value of those guidelines over the years to improve with the improvement of economic thinking just also in the guidelines i mean ten, 2010 there was like this concern for innovation concerns the dynamic approach to competition this that was a great improvement in the guidelines uh it doesn't look like uh, i don't know what you what you think Al, but it doesn't look like this dynamic approach to competition is something which is um perhaps the dominant thinking uh, at the ftc and we come back to a more static view of competition would you agree with that I'm not sure. I'm not so sure that this is uh, where we are. I think that people perceive dynamic competition differently, mm -hmm. and the perception of the people who are, part who are the or chief drafters of the executives' orders is that dynamic competition exists only when you have small businesses, and big businesses generally do not engage in a, a innovation and are suppressing innovation to protect themselves. So again, I think that you. 
every individual at the agencies would emphasize dynamic competition and they think it's important. It's about what kind of conditions uh, maintain or, or foster dynamic competition. And there are different approaches about that. Do I agree with the approaches that we need small businesses? I think that they're a little bit uh, went too far. Uh, but uh, again, that's kind of a prerogative when you are in power. But uh, overall, I, th we have n I do not think that it would be correct to say that we anyone has abandoned the confidence for a, in the need for dynamic competition. Yeah. Carl, do you want? Well, um, I see you have Schumpeter there in your background. So that's a big fan of Schumpeter. Uh, but I'm also a big fan of Ken Arrow. And I wrote a paper about 10 years ago called Competition and Innovation Did at the Bullseye, which has been well received, I would say, and widely distributed. The, the point, the key point, I think, and one doesn't need to be an antitrust expert or an economist to get this, is what's going to drive firms to innovate? It's either the opportunity to grab new business or the fear of losing it. Okay? So in my, the, the language I like to use is future sales need to be contestable. Okay? Now, if you've got a firm with a very large share right now, the, the drive to innovate is the fear of losing it. <laughs> okay? And so, so we need to have... So that firm, we don't want to let those the, the existing dominant incumbent firms block entrance and stiff arm them in order to reduce pressure on themselves. So, so, um, so dynamic innovation really important. I think the populace today they don't accept that we can have concentrated markets that result from innovation and large firms winning a large share of the market. So they misinterpret concentration evidence and other things. But the part where I tend to agree with them is we have to be very careful that when a firm is successful, that it can't erect barriers to entry. Right. Okay. And that's where antitrust section two of the Sherman Act particularly comes, comes into play. Um, uh, it's also for mergers. And it, we're going to see more action with large firms and let's say dominant firms buying potential competitors. And I think there's a widespread view that that should be controlled more in order to promote innovation and dynamic competition. Right. That's uh, that's perhaps one. Uh, I mean, the, the lowering of the barriers of entries is one of the key aspects in order for disruption, innovation, competition to always be uh, be, be here. And that, that would fo foster uh, dynamic competition. Uh, clearly, let, me add, let me add a quick point. So I spent way too much time studying uh, how Sean Peter got into his idea in his own work and when Schumpeterian ideas got into antitrust. So Schumpeter's writing about, Schumpeter writing was in the context of his uh, most, his longest and least, least successful work, his work about business cycles, where he saw that there were many depressions and problems, etc. So it was in a particular context and back then it was really valuable. But so this was kind of, but this is kind of a sidewalk of his it was massive treatise about business cycle, uh, business cycles. So that was one aspect. But then the question is, okay, we have that. We cannot get into his head, but we can see what he wrote. When did Schumpeter become a part of antitrust law? And so I looked who, who, when people started citing him, and this tend, tend to be highly related to the Microsoft trial. Before the Microsoft trials it was extraordinarily difficult to find Schumpeter in antitrust literature. I mean, people mentioned him by passing, uh, recognized that he existed, but he was not kind of part of the key idea or kind of something like in the magnitude of arrow. It was, it was kind of one aspect of the Schumpeterian idea, which is kind of a cartoonish approach of the Schumpeterian idea, is, oh, this is, we should not have antitrust enforcement because of because we can have a uh, disruption or creative destruction, etc. So I think that again, we should keep in mind the context. The idea itself, I think, is non-controversial. How it is interpreted, uh, it can be poorly interpreted. I agree with Carl. I think that the problem with the uh, uh, populists today is that they really refuse to accept the notion of what productivity and improved productivity means. Improved productivity means that that we can do more with with fewer resources, and therefore we don't need other things to be done, to be used, especially jobs. And they just they refuse to accept that. They think that everything can become better without cost. That's not the nature of markets. Right. 
that, that's very so Brock, um, I, I agree with you about Schumpeter coming into vogue more in the last 20 years. I did give a speech when I was the chief economist at DOJ in 1995 called Antitrust and Network Industries, where I laid this out in some detail. Um, uh, look, Amazon's a great example, right? Look, incredibly innovative, huge scale, super efficient, enormous benefits for consumers and a lot of small businesses too, who are selling through Amazon marketplace. Look, how could you doubt there's economies of scale in their warehousing system, in their IT systems, in their um, Supermarkets. procurement, you know, everything, right? I mean, it's all about scale. And um, yet there are some, including apparently the current chair of the FTC, who just see this as inherently worrisome because they've gotten so big and are supposedly dominant, although I don't know exactly what they're dominant of, um, but uh, she doesn't say in her article, but, but um, uh, this, is, this is dynamic competition in action. And look, maybe Amazon's done some misbehavior. I'm not saying they're, 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 they're pure as a driven snow, I'm just saying that the, reason, the way they achieved their position was largely, if not entirely, through competition on the merits whatever they might have done since they got that. And that's something we should applaud, period. Right. right. And to always I don't have see the that in the EO. I, you don't get that reading this executive order preamble. Not one bit. <laughs> yeah. And, and let me add to let me add a quick point. So first of all, uh, Carl Carl Bar Mitzvah paper from the 90s. Uh, there is an, it's, you, you cannot miss that because there was so you cannot miss when you do research about when Sean Patel uh, actually entered into antitrust language, you cannot miss that speech because there were very few works I mean, that were that mentioned Schumpeter earlier. So it was clear that people knew about Schumpeter, every economist, most antitrust people have knew of his idea, but they were not kind of part of kind of a guiding principle. So again, it kind of came up in the mid nineties and Carl's speech, again, if you do research, you cannot miss that speech. It's one of the first work that, that has been there. So that's one point. The other thing, what Carl point about Amazon, uh, Amazon, you cannot think about Amazon without an obsession with, uh, with satisfying consumers. I mean, it is just any of us who is a customer, is a, uh, an Amazon customer, the obsession is, 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 is amazing. They always try to satisfy you. Now, some perceive it as a problem because this is kind of a predatory practice. Uh, others think that, you know, this is consumer welfare. And I happen to believe that this is consumer welfare. Amazon is an important aspect of our household. By contrast, when Facebook is committed to neutrality, that's kind of a different aspect. So I think that you know there's a big difference between the statement and the value, or what the or what kind of value or what kind of values they present and how they affect reality. Amazon is a good example where their commitments actually serve consumers, expand the economy, seems to be, you know, I'm not saying that they do not engage in anti-competitive practices, but overall they have done amazing things for our economy. Facebook is a different story, and bundling <laughs> okay. bundling them all together seems odd and intellectually misguided. Yeah, that's the, the a money curve. I, of I use Amazon as my example, not Facebook. Yeah. Believe me. Let, let yeah, me just but, add, pick up on Schumpeter and the Microsoft case because I, I agree with you, Brock. The the and I, I testified uh, for the government in the remedy phase of the Microsoft case. It was disappointing to me that there wasn't a stronger remedy given the liability findings. But, but I want to say this is Microsoft case is really is is the case that the DOJ is looking at in their case against Google. It's going to be relevant mm -hmm. to the FCC's case against Facebook. It's relevant to cases possible private cases against Apple, whatever. And how did this happen? It happened because Joel Klein was really good. <laughs> appellate lawyer, assistant attorney general, he brought that case. It was somewhat aggressive at the time. And that's how you move antitrust law. Okay, Antitrust law has generally become uh, more shrunken and weaker in Section 2 over the last 30 or 40 years. And I've written a recent paper complaining about that. But here's this is the Microsoft case is the, the counterexample. And the way you do it is for the DOJ or potentially the FTC to be smart, focused case, litigate it well and defend it on appeal that's what the agency should be doing if they want to move the law 
you can't take huge leaps. You have to work with the common law tradition. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping that both agencies will do. It's too early to see, to know, but, but that would be helpful. And yes, in some cases, that's going to mean going after big, big firms or big tech firms, but it's based on the principles that are that underlie antitrust law as it has developed um, and trying to push back against some of the laissez-faire tendencies of the courts. Let me, let me present the same point slightly differently. Every person who is old enough, and it's unfortunate to say old enough, but if you are 40 or above and you have been in antitrust, you know that changing the law is a process and it's a dynamic. It's not coming up with an idea and turning a switch. And I think, it, again, people who have some experience know that it's not only that's because of we have constraints in reality, but rather it's actually important to have a process. Because, uh, you know, when we have the idea and we start kind of play, playing with it around how it can become an LO, it's not precise and it's good to have kind, kind of a discourse. So I think that, again, people who have been long enough are very, very cautious and think it's important to have the process. My concern, and I think it's many people have this concern, is right now we have people who have strong ideas and I think that there are some switches or levers that they can just tweak them and we will have, we'll be living in a different universe. And I don't think that it's going to work well. It can backfire most, more likely than succeed. Right, precisely to talk about uh, the, the process of having new rules, uh, there's at least one process that uh, we can see is, uh, is, is looming, uh, is also in the executive order, is for the FTC to use more expensively its rulemaking authority. Uh, not only the executive order asks for the FTC to use this uh, rulemaking authority more expensively, but also the, the chair of the FTC has, of course, uh, signaled that uh, she was very keen to do that. The rulemaking authority is this ex ante kind of regulations uh, to uh, prevent unfair methods of competition. So, Carl and, and Barak as well, what are uh, your, what is your stake on the expansion of the rulemaking authority uh, of the FTC. Uh, is that a, a substitute, a complement to antitrust? Uh, what are the potential beneficial and detrimental effects of uh, this authority on basically innovation, uh, as we talked about uh, Schumpeter? Uh, what is your, what is your, this, this advice that is uh, on, in the executive order to expand the rulemaking authority of the FTC? Uh, Carl? So, um... Let's just, just to level things, Section 5G and 5H of the executive order expressly call for the FTC at the, uh, to, to uh, look into rulemaking. What I have to believe happened is that Chair Khan wants to do this. She signaled that. And some people in the White House want to do it too. So mm -hmm. they're teaming up. You know, it's, from, it's, in, it's in her interest to have the White House say to do it. Mm -hmm. She wanted to do anyhow. So now you've got the power of the White House behind it. So there's a couple of issues though. First, to answer your question, this is not antitrust enforcement. This is sector specific rulemaking. It's properly called regulation, and uh, which isn't a dirty word in my book. It's just, it's just not antitrust enforcement. It's a set of rules that apply to specific industries. Or, or okay, uh, we have a lot of those. We call it regulation. I'm very big on environmental and health and safety regulation, for example. So, um, so then we're talking about the FTC uh, issuing regulations. Now, the FTC has, has issued a number of regulations over the year on, on uh, consumer protection. This is unfair, deceptive acts and practices. Right. What they have not done is issue regulations on unfair methods of competition. And that's what's being called for here. So now let me make a legal point, even though I'm an economist, and then a, a substantive point, an economic point, I mean. On the legal point, it's very unclear whether the FTC has the authority to issue substantive rules on unfair methods of competition. I won't go into it, but the Section 6G of the FTC Act that would, if they have authority, it's in this obscure subsection there, um, based on the Supreme Court's ruling in AMG, which is a nine, this spring, which was a nine to nothing ruling against the FTC's jurisdiction. It's questionable whether the FTC has the authority. It's a legal question. I will just say I hope they do, actually, because I think the FTC could do a lot of good things, but it's very unclear 
with the court, uh, whether whether the Supreme Court would agree. So there's a little cloud over it, a mm -hmm. big cloud over it, depending how you see it. Substantively, um, look, um, a couple of areas where rules have been proposed in the past that I like would be pay for delay deals in pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. which we have litigation, we have Supreme Court decision and activists, the FTC goes enforces that. They could have a focused, targeted rule that would strengthen and go beyond activists that I think would be good for competition. There's plenty of evidence to support it. They could go through normal Administrative Law uh, Procedures Act to support such a rule. And if they have the authority, I think it would be a good thing to do. Focused, a lot of experience, do it. Likewise, I think it would probably be good to have some rule regarding non-compete in labor for, 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 you know, for certain types of low-skilled labor or whatever. Be good. Um, we'll see, and maybe they'll do that. But what is but but what does this executive order call for? It calls for them to promulgate rules to address unfair competition in major internet market like marketplaces. What's well, that mean? What perhaps, the example you, perhaps the example you you referred earlier. Okay, so I'm just concerned. I don't know what we're talking about. Um, I could imagine some rules that are good. I can imagine some rules that are very bad. Um, so uh, it's quite open-ended here. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a little worried about that, but um, that's what we're looking at in this EO. I think it is another illustration of the difference between ideas and practicality. So let's start with the practicality. Uh, what will happen when you have a rule that gets all the way to the Supreme Court? Considering what we know about the jurisprudence of the individual justices, it is just not going to pass. Uh, they, will, they will basically shut it down. And again, if someone has the a belief or fantasies that the Supreme Court will rule differently, it will endorse rulemaking of the FTC, that individual should read actually decisions of all the individual judges and see what how they feel. It's not going to pass. Even if one conservative judge flips, we're still in the universe of five to four. So as a practical matter, I think it's a little bit a waste of resources to go in that to go down that direction. In terms of substance, I think it's a kind of reflects uh, some confusion that the uh, fairness and competitiveness are one and the same. So in the pres in the vision of the individuals who drafted the, that executive order and this, who have a, a, well, poli have a political appointees these days, uh, unfair is anti-competitive, and that's it's an interesting approach. People can have the, can have their own opinion about what is unfair and whether it's anti-competitive. I don't. I think it's a misguided approach. We I, I, fairness is a very broad to, to, to notion and. I just don't see how it is. I think it's going to, I don't see it related. Look, look, right. Let me give an example. Go to Amazon. Amazon develops Amazon Prime. That's hugely popular. Lots of people uh, buy stuff through Amazon Prime and, and instead of other companies or instead of stuff that's not on Prime, that's on Amazon. And maybe if there's a bunch of vendors who, they're, they're, they lose business as a result of that. Is that unfair? I think there's a lot of people who would, who are, have influence now who would say that's unfair and that if you had a rule, it would be some sort of self-preferencing by Amazon that would be made illegal. So um, that's what we that so I could you know, we could have a hundred examples like this if we think about some different yeah. firms. I think um, it's a I think it's a wonderful example actually. I really think so. I spent too, way too much time on the Amazon flywheel. If there's some religion within Amazon, it's the notion of flywheel, that the different elements accelerate each, supplement and accelerate each other. Within the flywheel, Amazon Prime is the, is, is the flywheel, but say this kind of, this is the glue that brings in clients. So on the one hand, Amazon said, we invest a lot in, in Prime because this is what brings customers and, and keep them here. And that's true. Uh, people who want to criticize Microsoft say, oh, it is uh, Amazon are, are, are terrified. Said, oh, this is actually what brings customers to Amazon. We don't want that to happen. But again, in terms of consumer welfare, in terms of how it affects households, I, I always ask myself, do these people who criticize Amazon, do, are they prime subscribers? Because if they are, they should <laughs> probably reconsider their thoughts. And if they are not, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry for them. It's really wonderful. 
Yeah. And another point that is kind of difficult to ignore is I really liked uh, Ted Lasso, the new production of Apple. Uh, so Apple, Apple Plus is a streaming service of Apple. The, prince, the kind of prime production are advertisings for Apple. If you watch any of these shows, many of them are good. If they're using only Apple products, basically after any episode you watch, if you, you use something that is not iPhone or not an Apple product, you feel that you're uncool, outdated, mm -hmm. and probably should reconsider the way you have been reaching your life. So is this some kind of self-preferencing? Should we impose restrictions on how they produce shows? And I think that it is of large principle that at the intuitive level might be attractive in, in terms of practicality, it is nonsensical in my mind. Right, that's that's a very uh, good point to, to, to close. That, that reminds us that disruptions, innovations harm competitors, right? It, it, it will harm the inefficient, the less, the sluggish uh, competitors. And that's also one thing to consider when we regulate competition. Uh, what is unfairness, as you said? Well, it can be unfair for uh, uh, can be seen as unfair, uh, a highly innovative company uh, can be seen as unfair by some rivals and competitors. So it's very difficult uh, question to to address. But that is the uh, in the executive order at least there is this uh, mandate for expanding the rulemaking authority and that needs to be used very carefully. That's why we we can take away from that discussion. Very few minutes. Uh, yeah, Carl, just one. Well, yeah. I just I think it's going to be fascinating to see what happens over the next couple of years with the FTC rulemaking mm -hmm. because it's a clear urge to do it at the FTC. The White House has is got behind that. Um, it's a hard thing to do, uh, but if, you know if it takes a year to write a rule and then it'll be challenged and it gets to the Supreme yeah. Court, this thing's going to take a few years to play out. Uh, we we just we just don't know what's going to happen, but it's it's like uh, stay on this channel. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> Stay on this channel, uh, right? So, few questions on the, from the from the audience precisely. Uh, perhaps on, in terms of timeline, uh, perhaps for you, Carl. How long do you think the new merger guidelines uh, would it take for them to be final? When do you expect the new guidelines to be adopted and final? Do you have a? Well, I'll tell you what we did in 2010. We in the summer of 2009, we got agreement between the FTC and DOJ to launch the project. We asked for, we, we had some internal work. We asked for public comments on what to do. We held workshops. Then we came out with a draft, probably around February, maybe, or March, April, something like that. And then we finalized them in August. So it took a little over a year, maybe 15 months with that process. It was hard to do, and we were pushing hard. And it was also a time when there were very few mergers because it was a great recession, actually. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and took uh, you know a lot of leadership and effort at both agencies, so it's hard to do in less than a year. I would say if you're going to do it, do it like public comments, all those steps. Um, so if they started tomorrow, you know maybe it'd be the end of 2022, um, okay. uh, something like that uh, would be fast. Um, that's what we did. I, I don't. They haven't said what they're going to do, and um, Jonathan Kander isn't confirmed yet. So that right. presumably they won't start until he's confirmed. So that might be next month. So, right. so you know, I think late 2022 or sometime first half of 2023 seems my guess, best guess. We'll hear from the agencies, I guess. It's pretty soon, I hope. So merging companies will be left in the dark uh, until then? No, I wouldn't say that. The current guidelines are in force. It's not like the vertical ones where the mm -hmm. FTC is doesn't really have any guidance now. Um, no, I think, I think we'll be in a situation where the current guidelines are for is that they're working very well mm -hmm. with the courts and with the you know with the business community and the agencies but we'll get some signals from the leaders at the ftc and doj about how they want to move away from them sure. uh, the trouble for them is if they bring a case to court and they want to do something different than the guidelines that's going to be very hard until they actually change them yeah and let me just add a quick point about the the effect on businesses. So I, I, I do corporate governance and I work with boards and I always try to figure out to just in that dimension of my life, whether boards of directors are aware of the executive orders or whether they, they think it's, a, it's an impact. Most boards of directors do not consider it some kind of a blip in their ordinary activities that do not think that now they have to think hard about the changes. So for, of course, of course, in certain industries, changes in the 
appoint, appointments in the in the agencies make a difference. Make a difference. But board of directors, I, there might have been some board of directors who had some kind of room that general the general council presentation of what the executive order means. Most board of directors don't even know that it ever adopted, issued, and don't think that it has any relevance to their future activity, including companies that are persistently engaged in acquisitions. So again, it's, it's smarter to keep in mind if market has uh, some meaning, it has not had a big impact on how boards of directors think about the issues. Right, right. And Talking about precisely the directions of uh, the, the leadership, uh, there's one question uh, from the audience about uh, these, these, uh, you know, these warning letters that we've seen from the uh, from the FTC that the merging companies can merge, but uh, they are still at risks uh, to have uh, these mergers being undone uh, subsequently. What's the value of what the member of the audience say, what's the value of this chaos, chaos uh, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty created for the merging company since uh, even if it's not prohibited, there's a risk for the mergers to be undone uh, in the future. Is there any value in what this member of the audience called a chaos? Well, there's a lot that the FTC can do to just um, make it more costly and uh, slower to merge. They have a lot of ability to do that under the, the Hudscott Rodino Act. Um, and they're doing things. I'm talking with, with a number of people. I'm tracking this quite closely. Um, there's a number of things they're doing. These, these letters saying we might come after you later. Other things having to do with the whole process of the second Quests and how mergers are investigating, whether they're taking longer, or asking for more information, yeah. etc. Um, so, so that's within the FTC's authority. Um, whether it's in the spirit of what Congress intended with the House Scott Rodino Act is is debated. Um, but it's also a short-term game. I mean, basically, the FTC has changed the rule, changed the way they're interacting with emerging companies. The merger bar is very sophisticated. Their clients, the firms who are merging, are very sophisticated. They're adjusting. They're like, okay, we're not going to agree to give more time. We're gonna, we'll give you this document. We think you're asking for too much. They just, they're adjusting. Some companies were caught in the middle because they didn't see this coming. Yeah, there's only so much the agency can do under the, their statutory powers. Um, they've changed the the way they're interacting. Uh, and look, it might deter some mergers just by putting sand in the gears. But that'll deter, um, you would think, uh, pro-competitive as well as anti-competitive mergers. The signals from the FTC is they want to deter mergers generally um, yeah. and because they think so many of them are anti-competitive. So this goes back to the narrative. We started this, this whole event, which is if you think almost all mergers are bad and they're a problem for the economy, why not stop them all? Yeah. But them all. Uh, all right, Barak, perhaps one uh, final thought about the executive order. Yeah, ju just a quick follow-up. The question is, if you're a lawyer who advises companies who consider a merger or acquisition, how much your opinion, how much your advice would change today uh, than it was uh, three years ago? And the answer is probably, well, there is something in the background that we need to address. And uh, it is, I, I don't think, you know, of course, there could be exceptions, but overall, I think that the they, it's in, they, they are lawyers, they know how to deal with problems, and they said, you know, the bill might be a little bit higher for this noise, not much more than that. Great. Carl, perhaps one final thought about the uh, executive order or the state of competition? No, I'm good. Uh, all right, it was a great event. Thank you both for uh, Thank joining you. the conversation. Very uh, inspiring and informative. Thank you, everyone, and uh, I'll see you next in this channel. All right, bye. Thank you.